Chapter 5 Circulation Time As we have seen, the movements of capital through the production sphere and the two phases of the circulation sphere are accomplished successively in time. The duration of its stay in the production sphere forms its production time, that in the circulation sphere its circulation time. The total amount of time it takes to describe its circuit is therefore equal to the sum of its production time and its circulation time. The production time includes, of course, the period of the labor process, but this is not all. We should first recall that a part of the constant capital exists in means of labor such as machines, buildings, etc., which serve for constant repetitions of the same labor process until they are worn out. The periodic interruption of the labor process, at night, for example, may interrupt the function of these means of labor, but it does not affect their stay in the place of production. They belong to this not only when they function, but also when they do not function. What is more, the capitalist must hold in reserve a certain stock of raw and ancillary materials, so that the production process can keep going for shorter or longer intervals on the previously determined scale, without depending on the accidents of daily supply on the market. This reserve of raw materials, etc., is only gradually consumed productively. There is therefore a difference between the capital's production time and its functioning time. The production time of the means of production generally comprises 1. The time during which they function as means of production and thus serve in the production process. 2. The pauses during which the production process, and thus also the functioning of the means of production incorporated in it, is interrupted. And 3. The time during which they are held in reserve as conditions of the process, and thus already represent productive capital but are not yet engaged in the production process. The difference so far considered is in each case a difference between the time that the productive capital remains in the production sphere and its time in the actual production process. But the production process may itself involve interruptions of the labor process and hence of working time, intervals in which the object of labor is exposed to the action of physical processes without further addition of human labor. The production process, and hence the function of the means of production, continues in this case, even though the labor process, and hence the function of the means of production as means of labor, is interrupted. This is the case, for example, with corn that is sown, wine that ferments in the cellar, or material of labor that is exposed to chemical processes, as in many industries such as tanning. Here, the production time is greater than the working time. The difference between the two consists in an excess of the production time over the working time. This excess is always based on the fact that the productive capital exists in a latent state in the production sphere, without functioning in the production process itself, or that it functions in the production process without being involved in the labor process. The part of the latent productive capital that is simply held in readiness as a condition for the production process, such as cotton, coal, etc., in the spinning mill, acts neither to form products nor values. It is idle capital, although its idleness forms a condition for the uninterrupted flow of the production process. The buildings, apparatus, etc., that are necessary for storing the productive reserve, the latent capital, are conditions of the production process and hence form components of the productive capital advanced. They fulfill their function by maintaining the productive components in the preliminary stage. They make the raw material, etc., dearer. But since a part of this labor, in the same way as a part of all other wage labor, is not paid for, it is productive labor and creates surplus value. The normal interruptions of the overall production process, i.e. the intervals in which the productive capital does not function, produce neither value nor surplus value. Hence the drive towards night work. See Volume 1, Chapter 10, Section 4. The intervals in the working time that the object of labor has itself to undergo during the production process create neither value nor surplus value, but they further the product, form a part of its life, a process that it must pass through. The value of the apparatus, etc., is carried over to the product in proportion to the entire period during which it functions. The product is placed in this stage by labor itself, and the use of this apparatus is just as much a condition of production as the reduction to dust of a part of the cotton that does not go into the product, but still carries its value over to it. The other part of the latent capital, such as the buildings, machines, etc., i.e. the means of labor whose function is interrupted only by the regular pauses in the production process, irregular interruptions as a result of a restriction of production, crises, etc., adds value without entering into the formation of the product. The total value that the means of labor add to the product is determined by the average length of their life. They lose value because they lose use value, not only in the time during which they are functioning, but also in the time during which they are not. 
Finally, the value of that part of the constant capital that continues in the production process even when the labor process is interrupted appears once again in the result of the production process. The means of production are here placed by labor itself in conditions in which they undergo by themselves certain specific natural processes, the result of which is a specific useful effect or changed form of their use value. Labor always carries over the value of the means of production to the product, to the extent that it actually consumes these deliberately as means of production. Nothing is altered here by whether the labor must, through the means of labor, act continuously on the object of labor in order to produce this effect, or whether it need only give the first impulse by placing the means of production in conditions in which they themselves undergo the intended alteration, without labor's further collaboration, as a result of natural processes. Whatever may be the reason for the excess of production time over working time, whether it is because the means of production form only latent productive capital, i.e. still exist in a stage preliminary to the production process proper, or because their specific function is interrupted within the production process by the pauses in it, or because finally the production process itself requires interruptions in the labor process, in none of these cases do the means of production function to absorb labor. If they absorb no labor, then they absorb no surplus labor. Hence there is no valorization of the productive capital, as long as this finds itself in that part of its production time that is in excess of the working time, no matter how inseparable these pauses may be from the accomplishment of the valorization process. It is clear that the nearer production time and working time approach to equality, the greater the productivity and valorization of a given productive capital in a given space of time. The tendency of capitalist production is therefore to shorten, as much as possible, the excess of production time over working time. But although the production time of capital may diverge from its working time, it always includes the latter, and the excess itself is a condition of the production process. Thus the production time is always the time that the capital takes to produce use values and valorize itself, hence to function as productive capital, although it includes time in which it is either latent or produces without being valorized. Within the circulation sphere, Capital exists as commodity capital and money capital. Its two circulation processes consist in transforming itself from the commodity form into the money form and from the money form into the commodity form. The circumstance that the transformation of the commodity into money is here at the same time the realization of the surplus value embodied in the commodity and that the transformation of money into commodity is at the same time the transformation of capital value into or back into the form of its elements of production in no way changes the fact that these processes, as processes of circulation, are processes of simple commodity metamorphosis. Circulation time and production time are mutually exclusive. During its circulation time, capital does not function as productive capital, and therefore produces neither commodities nor surplus value. If we consider the circuit in its simplest form, so that the entire capital value always moves at one stroke from one phase to another, then it is obvious that the production process is interrupted, and with it, therefore, the self-valorization of capital. So long as its circulation time lasts, and that according to the duration of the latter, the production process will be repeated sooner or later. If the various parts of the capital pass through the circuit in succession, so that the circuit of the total capital value is successively accomplished in the circuit of its various portions, then it is clear that the longer its aliquot parts remain in the circulation sphere, the smaller must be the part that functions at any time in the production sphere. The expansion and contraction of the circulation time hence acts as a negative limit on the contraction or expansion of the production time, or of the scale on which a capital of a given magnitude can function. The more that the circulation metamorphoses of capital are only ideal, i.e. the closer the circulation time comes to zero, the more the capital functions and the greater is its productivity and self-valorization. If a capitalist works to order, receives payment on the delivery of his product, and is paid in his own means of production, then his time of circulation approaches zero. Capital's circulation time generally restricts its production time, and hence its valorization process. Moreover, it restricts this in proportion to its duration. This can increase or decrease very considerably, and hence restrict the production time of capital to a very different degree. But what political economy sees is only the appearance, i.e. the effect of the circulation time on the valorization process of capital in general. It conceives this negative effect as positive, because its results are positive. 
it sticks all the more firmly to this illusion, as it seems to provide it with the proof that capital possesses a mystical source of self-valorization that is independent of its production process and hence of the exploitation of labor, and derives rather from the sphere of circulation. We shall see later how even scientific economics let itself be taken in by this illusion, an illusion which, as we shall show, is confirmed by various phenomena. 1. The capitalist way of calculating profit, in which the negative reason appears as positive, in that with capitals in different spheres of investment, in which only the circulation times differ, longer circulation time is the basis for a higher price, in short, is one of the bases in the equalization of profits. 2. The circulation time forms only one movement of the turnover time, but the latter includes the production time or reproduction time. And 3. The conversion of commodities into variable capital, wages, is conditioned by their previous transformation into money. In the case of capital accumulation, therefore, the conversion into additional variable capital takes place in the circulation sphere, or during the circulation time. Hence, the accumulation arising therefrom appears to be due to the circulation time. Within the sphere of circulation, capital passes through the two opposing phases C to M and M to C, in whichever order. Thus its circulation time breaks down into two parts, the time needed for its transformation from commodity into money, and the time that it needs for its transformation from money into commodities. We already know from the analysis of simple commodity circulation, see Volume 1, Chapter 3, that C to M, the sale, is the most difficult part of its metamorphosis, and thus forms the greater part of the circulation time in normal circumstances. As money, value exists in its ever-convertible form. As commodity, it must first receive this form of direct exchangeability and hence constant readiness for action by being transformed into money. What is involved in the circulation process of capital in its phase M to C is its transformation into those commodities which form the specific elements of productive capital in a given sphere of investment. The means of production may not be present on the market, needing first to be produced, or they may have to be drawn from distant markets, or there may be dislocations in their normal supply, changes of price, etc. In short, a mass of circumstances that are not recognizable in the simple change of form M to C, but require for this part of the circulation phase either less time or more. Just as C to M and M to C are separated in time, so they may be also separated in space, the selling and the buying markets being in different places. In factories, for example, buyers and sellers are frequently even different persons. Circulation is just as necessary for commodity production as is production itself and thus agents of circulation are just as necessary as agents of production. The reproduction process includes both functions of capital, and thus also the need for these functions to be represented, either by the capitalist himself or by salaried workers, his agents. But this is just as little a reason for confusing the circulation agents with the production agents as it is a reason for confusing the functions of commodity capital and money capital with those of productive capital. The circulation agents must be paid by way of the production agents. But if capitalists who buy and sell among themselves create by this act neither products nor value, this situation is not altered when the scale of their business enables them to pass this function on to others, and indeed makes it necessary to do so. In many businesses, sellers and buyers are paid in the form of a percentage of profit. The phrase that they are paid by the consumers is no help at all. The consumers can pay only insofar as they themselves produce, as agents of production, an equivalent in commodities, or alternatively appropriate this form of the production agents, whether by a legal title, as their partners, etc., or through personal services. There is a distinction between C to M and M to C that has nothing to do with the difference in form between commodities and money, but derives from the capitalist character of production. In and for themselves, both C to M and M to C are mere translations of the given value from one form into the other. But C prime to M prime is at the same time the realization of the surplus value contained in C prime. Not so M to C. Hence the sale is more important than the purchase. M to C is in normal conditions a necessary act for the valorization of the value expressed in M, but it is not a realization of surplus value. It is a prelude to its production, not an appendix to it. Their very form of existence of commodities, their existence as use values, sets certain limits to the circulation of the commodity capital C' prime to M'. Prime. If they do not enter into productive or individual consumption within a certain interval of time, according to their particular characteristics, in other words, if they are not sold within a definite time, then they get spoiled and lose, together with their use value, the property of being bearers of exchange value. 
both the capital value contained in them and the surplus value added to it are lost. Use values remain the bearers of perennial and self-valorizing capital value only insofar as they are constantly renewed, are replaced by new use values of the same or another kind. Their sale in their finished commodity form, i.e. their entry mediated through sale into productive or individual consumption, is, however, the constantly repeated condition for their reproduction. They must change their old use form within a certain time and continue their existence in a new one. It is only through this constant renewal of its body that the exchange value maintains itself. The use values of different commodities may decay at different speeds. Thus, a greater or lesser interval may elapse between their production and their consumption, and they may thus persist for a shorter or longer time in the circulation phase C to M as commodity capital, endure a shorter or longer circulation time as commodities. The limitation of the circulation time of commodity capital, imposed by the spoiling of the commodity body itself, is the absolute limit of this part of the circulation time, or of the time for which the commodity capital can circulate as commodity capital. The more perishable a commodity, the more directly after its production it must be consumed, and therefore sold, the smaller the distance it can move from its place of production, the narrower, therefore, is its sphere of spatial circulation, and the more local the character of its market. Hence, the more perishable a commodity, the greater are the absolute barriers to its circulation time that its physical properties impose, and the less appropriate it is as an object of capitalist production. Capitalism can only deal in commodities of this kind in populous places, or to the extent that distances are reduced by the development of means of transport. The concentration of the production of an article in a few hands, however, and in a populous place, can create a relatively large market, even for an article of this kind, as is the case with the big breweries, dairies, etc.